As we've heard from uh, a number of talks today, we know that humans originated somewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa, and from there they expanded to occupy essentially every corner of the Earth landmass. And in doing so, they have encountered a tremendous diversity of habitats and environments, environments that differ in terms of um, climate, which is a major focus of our research, but also in terms of nutrient availability, resource availability, degree of solar radiation, and so forth. And these environments are illustrated here in this map of the ecoregions of the continents. And so these different aspects of human environments have exerted strong selective pressures on uh, human metabolic processes and physiological processes. And uh, certainly, um, they, uh, adaptations have arisen in response to these selective pressures. So environmental change is truly a defining feature of human evolution, um, where in part is due to uh, movement of populations, therefore experiencing new environments, but there is also variation um, of habitats and environments over time, illustrated here by in this diagram that has population size on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And as you can see, there are a number of changes uh, marked by uh, different transitions uh, during human evolution. Among these transitions, we recognize two as perhaps the most important ones, meaning the ones that have probably been associated with uh, most selective pressures. Uh, the first one is the out of Africa expansion, which uh, uh, occurred sometime earlier than 40,000 years ago. During this transition, uh, humans were exposed to col colder climates, lower degrees of UV radiation, different nutrients, and also uh, lower pathogen loads. And then much more recently, sometime uh, more recently than 9,000 years ago in the Neolithic Revolution, uh, humans shifted away from a subsistence based on foraging, which characterized much of human existence up to that point, and the adoption of different subsistence strategies based on horticulture, pastoralism, and intensive agriculture. Um, these changes, uh, in turn, induced a number of other changes, uh, for example, at the level of the diet, which became much more rich in carbohydrates, and milk became a major uh, staple of adult diet. Uh, but also there were massive increases in population densities, which led to um, uh, an increase in pathogen loads, an increase in trans uh, transmission rates of infectious diseases. So uh, really, uh, as I said, environmental change has been a major defining feature of human evolution. And humans have encountered this tremendous diversity of environments, responding with cultural, behavioral, and genetic adaptations that led ultimately to the wonderful diversity of phenotypes and cultures that we see in human populations today. Some of the phenotypes that vary across human populations are actually diseases. In fact, many common diseases have significant interethnic differences, and these include diseases of the immune response, like asthma, multiple sclerosis, but also metabolic diseases, like type 2 diabetes, or different types of cancers, like prostate cancer. There are some phenotypes that, in addition to varying greatly across uh, human populations, they also have striking geographic uh, patterns. This is the case, for example, for body size and proportions, which are known based on classical work to be correlated with climate variables. As shown here on the vertical axis, we have the body mass index, and on the horizontal axis, the mean annual temperature in worldwide human populations, so that populations living at opposite ends of the climatic range, like this Maasai in uh, uh, eastern sub-Saharan Africa, and this Inuit from uh, eastern Siberia, have rather different body size and proportions, which suggest that humans, just like most other mammals, conform to general ecological rules that suggest that body size and proportions are adaptations to different uh, types of climates. 
Um, another phenotype that has striking differences across ethnic groups and also striking geographic patterns is pigmentation. We know that pig uh, skin reflectance, which is a measure of pigmentation, is strongly correlated in worldwide populations with latitude or distance from the equator, which, uh, as we've heard before, um, suggests that variation in pigmentation is adaptive with regard to different degrees of shortwave radiation. So these are two cases in which phenotypic variation appears to be a function of a particular environmental variable. So we thought that based on this information that one could look for genetic variants that have similar geographic patterns with the idea that these genetic variants might be adaptive with regard to different aspects of the environment. And we do that by using this approach that we refer to as environmental correlations, where essentially we look for uh, correlations between allele frequencies and um, specific aspects of the environment. So we first start by classifying populations based on the environment they live in. And then we search for genetic variants whose frequency is correlated with the environmental variable of interest in the populations that we studied. And then if we find a correlation shown in this diagram here between the environmental variable and allele frequency, we infer that this is an adaptive variant with regard to environmental variation. However, if the allele frequency is not predicted by the environmental variable, we assume that this variant does not confer a selective advantage in different uh, environments as defined by the particular environmental factors that we've considered. So we use this approach on a particular data set, which includes more than 640,000 autosomal markers, uh, which were genotyped in more than uh, 1,300 individuals from 61 indigenous populations worldwide, the distribution of which is shown here on this map. With regard to the environment, we use a set of uh, environmental variables that, that can be broadly classified into three categories, climate variables, which are all continuous, and then uh, ecoregion and subsistence variables, which are categorical and analyzed as dichotomous variable. The climate, variable, um, the climate variables were chosen um, among those that are most likely to reflect the impact of cold stress and heat stress um, on human physiology, uh, as well as different degrees of UV radiation. Um, ecoregion is, as I said, a categorical variable that mainly contains information about climate, but as I said, it's, uh, um, it uses information in a dichotomous manner. And then the subsistence variables can be further subdivided into mode of subsistence and main dietary component where uh, the subsistence mode includes foraging, horticulture, pastoralism, and advanced agriculture. And the main dietary components are cereals, roots and tubers, fat, milk, and meat. So we've applied this um, approach to this genome-wide data set, and I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. Um, so in these two diagrams, which reflect two uh, strong signals of correlation between uh, a SNP and in this case a, for a foraging subsistence, while in this case it's a correlation uh, at this SNP between allele frequency and relative humidity. What we find is that on the horizontal axis, we have the individual populations but grouped based on the major geographic area. And then on the vertical axis, we have allele frequencies. Now, if we focus on the left portion of this slide, um, I color coded the populations, or at least the, the categories of populations. In red, we have the foragers. In light blue, the non-foragers. And then this horizontal line indicates the mean allele frequency for populations within a certain category and within a certain geographic area. And so what you can see is that the signal that we find is that not all foragers have the same allele frequencies and all non-foragers have a different and identical allele frequency. Rather, what we find is that there is a consistent shift in allele frequencies between foragers and non-foragers that is observed in multiple geographic regions as if selection acted on subdivided populations in parallel to increase the frequency of a particular variant that is advantageous 
with regard to that particular uh, um, uh, aspect of the environment. And this SNP, uh, codes, this, uh, SNP is in a gene that codes for interleukin-22, which is a, um, a potent mediator of the innate immune response. And so it may make sense with regard to the changes in pathogens associated with the foraging to non-foraging subsistence. On the right, we have a correlation between allele frequencies and a climate variable, which is continuous. And again, the pattern that we see is that there are clients of allele frequencies that repeat themselves in multiple geographic locations. And in this case, this is a non synonymous substitution in the keratin-77 gene, which is expressed in the ducts of actin sweat glands. And therefore, it makes sense that this uh, SNP might reflect adaptations to heat stress in uh, influence in the way the body can uh, cool down its temperature by sweating. Another example in this case with a dietary component was observed at this PLRP2 uh, gene. Um, this, is, this gene codes for an enzyme that metabolizes galactolipids, which are a main component of plants. And interestingly, what we found is that there is a polymorphic stop codon. So in other words, this is a, a, a shorter protein um, that occurs at higher frequency in populations that specialize in cereal compared to populations that do not, as shown here, where the red um, indicates the frequency of the variant in populations that specialize in cereals versus uh, the blue populations. So again, these consistent shifts in allele frequencies that are observed in multiple independent locations. And the interesting thing is that uh, we predict, based on the biochemical evidence, that this top codon, even though it results in a truncated protein, this protein is more active. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense that it's found in populations that have a plant-based diet, which is rich in cereal. Another type of analysis that one can do uh, to learn more about the biology of these signals, but also to uh, sort of increase our confidence that we are finding something real, is to look at whether these signals are enriched in genes that have specific biological functions. And so we looked at dietary specializations in roots and tubers, which is one of the classes where we have some of the strongest signals. And what we find is that the two biological pathways that are most enriched in these signals of environmental correlations are starch and sucrose metabolism and folate biosynthesis. And that's actually what you would expect for roots and tubers, which are rich in starch and poor in folates. And so it's very comforting to see uh, this particular result. With regard to uh, adaptations to the polar ecoregion, we find uh, several metabolic pathways that are involved, involved in energy metabolism and therefore in the production of heat and the maintenance of body temperature in the face of a cold climate. Another type of approach that we can use to learn about uh, the biology of these environmental adaptations is by comparing our results with those from genome-wide association studies. So as I just explained, this, uh, our approach connects particular polymorphisms with specific aspects of the environments that are considered proxies for the selective pressures that underlie the signals that we observe. Genome-wide association studies, in contrast, connect polymorphism with specific phenotypes. And so now, if we look at the strongest signal from our analysis, as well as the strongest signal from genome-wide association studies, and we ask which polymorphisms have strong environmental correlations, as well as strong association with phenotypes, we can start to make a connection along this side of this triangle and ask questions such as which phenotypes were acted on by natural selection and which specific aspects of the environment shaped these phenotypes, which selective pressures shaped these phenotypes. When we do this exercise, we find that there are many SNPs that have strong signals with climate and are associated with pigmentation and tanning phenotypes in genome-wide association studies. This is exactly what we would have expected based on what I told you in the beginning, that the pigmentation phenotypes have this clinal distribution with a gradual uh, change as a distance, uh, as a function of distance from the equator, as a function of solar radiation. 
Um, the other result that we have that perhaps is less expected but very interesting is that many of the overlap between the two analyses identify the um, phenotypes of the immune response and in particular autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, systemic lupus erythematosus, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, psoriasis, and so forth. Um, this is also not entirely unexpected. Um, because we know that there is a great deal of uh, diversity in the way, in, there is a, a very striking pattern of the geographic distribution of pathogens, which is very established in the literature, that pathogen diversity decreases as a function of distance from the equator. And it was shown a few years ago that climate, and in particular humidity, are very important factors in shaping this gradient, this latitudinal gradient of diversity. So it makes sense that we find uh, these particular observations which suggest that pathogens are probably the true selective pressure acting on these polymorphisms and that climate is essentially uh, acting on pathogens and which in turn act on, on, uh, on polymorphisms. So we are looking basically at the indirect effect of uh, climate on um, selected alleles. Now, by no means um, these uh, um, pathogens represent the only selective pressure shaping this kind of um, signals, but it certainly, uh, as based on this analysis, um, uh, uh, it's, in, it's certainly a, an important component of it. So um, to conclude, uh, I showed you that there are uh, very strong genome-wide signals of adaptations to climate, to ecoregion, to dietary components and subsistence in uh, worldwide population samples. Um, many of these signals are found in genes whose function can be easily connected with the biology of the adaptations and the specific uh, environmental factor that was used to identify the signals. Um, the signals are due to relatively subtle, and I, I didn't uh, talk much about this, but relatively subtle, but consistent shifts in allele frequencies that occur in multiple geographic regions uh, across uh, populations that experience different environments. And we found that adaptation to different climates make an important contribution to pigmentation phenotypes as we expected, as well as to diseases of the immune response. Um, I'd like to put a plug for this dbcline. This is a database that we have uh, generated in my lab. You can find it at this uh, URL, and you can search the database for signals of environmental correlations uh, with en 21 environmental variables, and we have links to other selection browsers. And then finally, I want to thank uh, the people in my lab and my collaborators uh, who contributed uh, to this particular research.